thanks and praise um, always for being home and with my family and for my brother who always does the most, says the most. I think the next time I come, I'm just going to like, when he gets ready to introduce, I'm just going to walk up and be like, we good. We good. Um, but we're going to settle into this text. So, you know, as always, I'm, as I said, I'm thankful to God for the gift of life and I'm thankful to God for you. I'm thankful to God for my people back home, right? And I'm thankful for God to, for my space in this space. Today is Palm Sunday, and though we aren't looking traditionally at a Palm Sunday text, um, in a few moments you're going to see that uh, we're actually revisiting the text that Pastor Mike started preaching last week. Um, and so this will be a continuation of that. And so I won't give you the background. So if you missed the sermon last week, just go back and watch it. You get all the background you need to get um, so that we aren't rehashing that. But this is a text that would not let me go. Okay. And it is a text that actually follows the traditional Palm Sunday text where Jesus, you know, triumphantly enters the city, okay? The waving of the palms, not just a symbol of peace, but as a foreshadowing of Jesus's triumph. Palms were what Romans would often give to people who had proclaimed or received victory. And so we are going to lean into this text today as um, we remember what Pastor Mike taught us about um, being on the lookout for Jesus, right? Um, and we are picking up this text after these Greeks have been looking for Jesus, have found Jesus, and Jesus is now being told that folks are looking for him. Getting the wrong thing or getting the right thing wrong, getting the right thing wrong. John 12, 20 through 26 says this. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip who was born, um, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said to him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Mm. Philip went and told Andrew and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Glorified here, meaning um, for the true character of Jesus to be revealed, and then the proper weight and respect given to that true character. And then Jesus continues and says, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. Yes. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Fruit here meaning that which is eternal, that which is produced in partnership with God. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Let's pause and pray. Almighty God, we acknowledge that we come in this moment from many places and from many experiences just this morning. And so for all the ways that we have entered into your presence here today, Almighty God, we pray in this moment that for each of us individually and collectively, that you will silence the voices within us, that we may hear yours, that we may receive, and that you may grow the part of us necessary in the hearing of this word that we collectively might be more and more every day who you've called us to be and who you've created us to be. Work within us and then work beyond us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. There are many times um, as I look back over my childhood where I can recall that the way death was talked about and hailed was often in relation as to whether or not someone was saved or not. 
And so if a person died and was saved, then the funeral was a celebration of life. If we believe the person was not saved, then you could bet your bottom dollar at some point at the end of that service, there was going to be an altar call. So that those who were there who needed the opportunity would have the opportunity to take advantage of that opportunity of salvation that the deceased had not. I can even recall some adults in my life experiencing an extra measure of sadness or even pity for the loved ones of those who died unsaved. It was almost as if they had no access to peace in their grief. Now, as an adult, I have come to learn that all death be hard. And that what makes grief complicated or complex amid the death of a loved one often has more to do either with how a person dies, the timeliness of their death, or how they moved in relationship to others for any number of reasons before they died. And it is also beyond me at this point in my life to be able to grasp why it is that we felt at any point that we could know the state of a person's soul at the point of their death. Now, I get it. I get that death falls in the unknown and that the unknown often creates in us fear and the way that we respond to fear more often than not is to um, pretend that we know what we can't know in an effort of like creating this illusion of security. I get that, right? And yet I believe in this case, it means for us that we got the right thing wrong. Meaning we understood some truth about death, but the way we used that knowledge, applied it, was incorrect. I can know that a bicycle is a form of transportation, but if I try to ride that bicycle across a body of water, I'm not getting very far. Getting the right thing wrong. Now I believe this text if you bear with me, we move through it. Can help us perhaps move away from or minimize the times that we get the right things wrong. And here's the first thing I believe this text tells us, is that not everything called by the same name is the same. Not everything called by the same name is the same. Now, y'all, Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single grain of wheat. But if it dies, right, it'll produce lots of fruit. Now, I'm reading this, and I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Are you saying, Jesus, that in order for us to be fruitful, in order for us to produce that which is eternal, we got to die? I thought you said your yoke was easy and your burden was light. Now, we don't know a whole lot about death. We don't know everything about death, right, Pastor? But you know what we do know? Death be hard. Even Jesus wrestles with death in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Like there is nothing light or easy about death. What you talking about, Jesus? And so I'm wrestling with this text, and you know what continues to come up over and over and over again? Proverbs 14 and 12 comes up, and this is what it says. There is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end it leads to death. There is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it leads to death. Okay, okay, Jesus. I am, I am like thoroughly humbled 
Maybe what I think this passage means isn't what it means. But now I have another question. I want to know if the death in Proverbs means the same thing as to die in what Jesus is saying about this grain of wheat. And y'all, show sure enough. It ain't the same. Now, let me give a caveat. We're about to step through some variations of meanings of a lot of words. I don't want you to get hooked up on the meaning, okay? But I got to name these things so that you know I didn't pull this stuff out my head. <laughs> that I need you to know that I did the work, <laughs> okay? So don't get hung up on it, but I need to name it so that perhaps God can invite us into a deeper understanding of this text, okay? Now, there are, in this Proverbs text, the word death or dead means a state or place of death. It is opposed to life. It is concretely dead. Okay? It comes from a word, maveth. In the text that Jesus is speaking around this grain of wheat dying, this comes from a word, apothanesco. This stresses the significance of the separation of that which comes with divine closure. It is the ending of what is former to bring what naturally follows. Okay, so one, concrete death. It is the place or location, the state of being dead, no more. The other marks a transition of divine closure that makes way for what will naturally follow. Okay, Jesus, okay, I can get with this. Right? I can get with this. It just turns out that all death is not created equal. Everything that goes by the same name is not the same. There was an um, experiment done on redwood trees that I read a report on where the researchers injected the redwood trees with a chemical substance similar to adrenaline in an effort to get it to bypass hibernation. Now, though redwood trees are evergreens, meaning um, they keep green leaves year round, they still go through a process of shedding leaves that have died or who have run their course in order to make room or space for new. And when they injected these redwood trees with this substance, it did in fact skip hibernation. It did not shed leaves. However, these trees that had lived for hundreds of years died within one year. Because it bypassed apothanesco. The process of shedding, of letting go that which has run its course to make room for what is new. And because it bypassed apothanesco, it led to Malveth, the state of being dead. Done. Everything called by the same name ain't the same, y'all. Okay, I got it, Jesus, that's cool. And we're accustomed in our faith to letting old things go, to make room for new. But as I kept reading the passage, I then had to ask myself, but is Jesus talking, though, about something specific? Is there something specific in this context? Remembering, y'all, Jesus, everything around this text or the context of what Jesus is saying is shrouded by the fact that Jesus knows he's about to die. And we should listen differently when someone says something and they know they are leading up to death. Right? These are some very weighty words. And so I want to know, we know about letting go of stuff, but is there something specific Jesus is saying needs to die? Apothanesco. Yeah. Which takes us to our second point. Attachment to the wrong will kills. Attachment to the wrong will Kills. 
So y'all, I just stepped out of the ring of wrestling with the first thing Jesus said. <laughs> Have any of y'all ever watched a movie and that movie had one too many like anxiety provoking plot twists? And you like, you know what? I don't even know if I can keep watching this. Y'all got me on, y'all got me all up in anxiety, right? This is how I felt reading this, reading this um, text, right? Because I mean, I just stopped wrestling with one only to move into what I felt like was even more disturbing. What does Jesus say? Jesus said, those of you who love your life will lose it. But those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Okay, Jesus, please tell me, what is wrong with loving my life? Right? I mean, Jesus, uh, really, isn't another name for God love? You have got to be kidding me. And for those of us who navigate this world in such a way where we have to work hard to love ourselves in a world that hates and despises us, this can be very unsettling. But there is a way that seems right to a person. But in the end, it leads to death. And I had already been humbled. And so I said, okay, let me lean in. And y'all, what I found was not what I thought it would be. Again, don't get caught up in the definitions. This is just proving that I did my work. The word love here is the expression of to be friendly, but more importantly, it means attachment, a matter of sentiment. What is attachment? Attachment for us today is a deep, enduring emotional bond that connects you to another across time and space. A deep, enduring emotional bond. Life means soul. And generally, we understand the soul as the mind, the will, and the emotions. For us today, it is seated very deeply as the place of the will, our will. Okay? And our souls generally is the thing that's understood to live after our body dies. It, it has the capacity for everlasting life. Lose, utterly destroy. And then, of course, hate here means to love or esteem less and by default unattached. Now, so, again, don't get caught up. I'm going to reread these verses in light of this shift. Those who are attached, emotionally bonded across time and space to their own will shall have it utterly destroyed. And those who esteem less or are not emotionally bonded to their own will, unattached, shall preserve it for eternal life. Okay, if we are emotionally bonded across time and space to our own will, how is there ever going to be space for God's will to be working and activated in our life? Come on now, y'all. Now, this is not about total detachment from our will. This is not saying that we are not in possession of our will. This is to esteem less, right? It is to make room for it. This means that we will not allow our wills to get in the way of that which can bring us to the greater, right? To the what? More, okay? Now, there's this trilogy called Lord of the Rings based off these books. And in this movie, there is a character, Gollum. And Gollum is so attached to one of the rings that he literally gives up his whole life, his health, 
his mind, his relationships laid on the altar of attachment to these dreams. Y'all, attachment is all those clothes that I ain't been able to wear for 10 years. Still in my closet. It's, a se- it's Lent, y'all. It's a season of confession. Taking up space for what could be more useful. The Institute for Health did a study, and in their study, they reported that the number one reoccurring bias that their test subjects displayed in decision making was overconfidence. They said more times than not, the people they studied made decisions on simplified information And then they um, applied uh, an over uh, amount of, um, they over, what's the word? I'm sorry, y'all, perimenopause. (laughs) (laughs) So after they make the decision on limited information or or on um, this level of information, then they um, place too much weight, okay? They place too much weight on the accuracy of their judgment. So they were overconfident. They made the decision based on very um, limited information or simplified information. And then they placed too much weight on the accuracy of their judgment. Y'all, black women are 243% more likely to die of pregnancy-related death in this country than white women. In large part due to racial bias, and to a cognitive lack of empathy of others, namely in dominant culture, but across the board, to uh, a lack of empathy for our pain. Y'all, attachment to the wrong will kills. And any of us can name any other number of statistics for which this is true. But we're seeing the genocide in Palestine. This is what we're seeing. Attachment to our own will kills. But what happens? What happens when it's not so easy to see? What happens when it's not quite as clear? My daughter, who is now a teenager, My daughter, who is now a teenager, when she was in the third grade, um, was working very, very hard in school. And don't get me wrong, she's always worked very, very hard. But term after term, there was one class that would keep her from the honor roll. And she would get so agitated and so angry despite putting in all the work. No matter how many times my husband and I told her, we are so proud of you, right? That we've never really had, or we try not to have a standard for our children of being the best, just doing your best, right? With the understanding that your best might change from day to day and season to season. It ain't gonna be the same all the time. And so we couldn't understand why her anxiety was continuing to escalate. Like you're not getting in trouble, like we're so proud of you. And then we find out that the school has started giving a party to the kids who got the honor roll in an effort to motivate others to get higher grades. And immediately, it dawned on me. Immediately, I realized that something I would have considered at one point in my life a very innocent, positive thing was literally making my daughter feel like she was being punished for not being good enough. It was literally killing very quickly her motivation to do her best. And so (laughs) I advocated with the teacher and the principal, not just for my baby, right? But for all those babies whose parents didn't have the ability to help them with their homework or to pay for tutoring, right? And to the principal's credit, 
She was not so attached to her wheel that she couldn't hear what we were saying, and the practice ended. Now, what this taught me, though, was how easy it is for us to get the right thing wrong. It is right to celebrate our children for doing their best. It is not right for us to make the standard of whether or not they're doing their best based upon a grade. But you know what else this taught me? It taught me that though it's easy to get the right thing wrong, it also can be corrected. Yeah. It can be corrected. Yeah? You see, what this is about, right? This idea that those who are unattached to their own will, right? This idea is not about us giving up our sense of autonomy, quite the contrary, right? It's about using our autonomy to choose to move in, a, in the world through, through the world with a posture that says, I am always open to the will of God intercepting and disrupting my own. This is not about assuming that we're always wrong, y'all. It's about always being willing to um, ask whether or not we are. And you all, scripture backs this up. It backs it up, okay? And what it, maybe that slide ain't in here. Nope, that's all right. We are gonna keep going. <laughs> scripture backs this up. So we know in 1 Corinthians 13, it says what? We see through a mirror dimly, right? We see through a mirror dimly. Then you go back to Proverbs 3. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge God and what God will make your paths straight. But perhaps most importantly, Romans 12. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to test and approve what is the what? Perfect will of God. Come on, y'all. Come on. Do you realize? That if we are emotionally bonded to our own will, that means that we are constantly leaning only on our own understanding. That means there is no room for the understanding of others, but namely, no room for the understanding of God. Do you hear how scary that is? Yes. Attachment to the wrong will kills. And that takes us to our final piece, which is this is more about what happens now than about what happens later. This is more about what happens now than about what happens later. The word eternal here is a word that means not just what comes later, which is how we generally hold eternal, right? We usually talk about eternal, uh, about that great beyond in the afterlife. But the word eternal here is about holding all that is, all that has ever been, and all that will be. It is about this concept of being inside time, outside of time, and beyond time. But more than anything, it is not talking about the future per se. It is saying that as believers, we have access and live in eternity right now. Okay? So when Pastor Mike says in his sermon last week, right, that believers have always outlived the empire. This is saying to us, even right now, we are literally in the moment outliving the empire. Yeah. This is not about accessing something in the great beyond. This is about right now. So those who are not emotionally bonded to their own will shall preserve it 
for eternity. You all, you know what that sounds like to me? That sounds a lot like salvation. And if we take at a base level what salvation is, that process of connecting us in right, whole relationship with God, a relationship that was broken because of our will to be independent, Right? What Jesus is naming here is access to salvation right here, right now, in the real time. But what we don't often realize is that I believe the invitation for salvation, the invitation for this kind of life, is always around us every day, all the time. It's woven. Okay? Bear with me for just a few more minutes, and I'm going to take my seat, I promise. That in these words, y'all, Jesus is speaking to a cycle of death and resurrection. And whether or not we realize it or not, death and resurrection shows up throughout creation. That Jesus came and epitomized this process, but the process of death and resurrection was here before Jesus came in the flesh. All right? The death of a star can bring forth the life of a new star and even a new planet, death and resurrection. In our bodies, old dead skin cells are shedded when new skin cells rise to the surface. Every five to six weeks, our skin is made new, death and resurrection. When a cell dies within our body, it is in part recycled to make new white cells. White cells are the cells that protect us from disease and infection, death and resurrection. When an old tree and old leaves and old plants die, they make room for the new and they actually feed into the ecosystem nutrients. In fact, one environmentalist says this. He says, the life of a dead tree is abundant. Do you hear me? The life of a dead tree is abundant. Death and resurrection. What if, what if, y'all, what if resurrection is not in defiance of nature, but it's a testimony to it? What if it bears witness to its true essence that everywhere we look, God has woven into the very ways that we live and breathe the process for continuing to live and breathe death and resurrection. that we receive salvation through the death and resurrection of Christ through grace. It's right here, right now, all the time, in the real moment. This is about how we move now, y'all. This is about how we move through the world right now. But what if there's a little bit more? What if this isn't just about being saved? Okay, so we saved, great, now what? Our God lives in the infinite. There is always more. What if this is also the process for us of always gaining with every cycle higher consciousness, with always moving with every cycle deeper in relationship to God? It's not just being, but it's becoming who we were created to be higher and higher, deeper and deeper, more and more and more. And so some of you might ask, if we know this to be the process of transformation, why is it that more of us aren't trying to follow it? My dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Fatima Saleh, she says to me, she says, Donna, when we behold the beauty of autumn leaves changing colors, we are beholding the process of their death. There can be no resurrection without death. And y'all, all death, all 
death, even death that is wrapped in the beauty that leads to life, be hard. All of it, be hard. And so, the elders of my childhood and even me, myself, we did get death right insofar as it's not all created equal. There is death that is dead, and there is death that leads to new life. However, I can't help but to wonder in light of this passage, if our insistence, our overconfidence in the fact that we knew without a shadow of a doubt which path others or even we ourselves were headed towards, made me wonder if maybe we were too attached to our own will that it is very much possible to be so obsessed with what comes later that we miss what is coming now. And if we miss what is coming now, we lose what will come later. Don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will take care of itself. I ain't worried about eternal life in the afterlife, because guess what? Eternal life is right now. So, and I promise I'm about to take my seat. For the sake of all of the people that we declared unsaved, for our own sakes, I hope to God that we got the right thing wrong. And in response, and repentance, I pray this prayer. May the perfect will of God always, always prevail. In the name of Jesus, amen.